Hey, Ronnie Vale, Four Wheeling Australia. Very exciting news today. I have new stuff for the Land Cruiser. As you, or as some of you might know, the front diff housing was cracked, which is on the floor right there. And the latest sort of video about the Land Cruiser, I mentioned that I crushed my crown wheel or pinion inside the actual casing. This is how you tell if your crown wheel or pinion is gone. Inside the diff center, well that'll be revealed in this video exactly what has happened. We've got it on the bench over there. Today is a happy day for me, very happy day. As some of you may know, or may not know, my front diff housing is cracked and bent, and my crown wheel, I think it's my crown wheel, or my diff center at least, is destroyed. It happened a couple of weeks ago. So why am I happy? Well, because these guys, just behind me here, Newtown Toyota, are helping me out with a brand new diff housing, which is in the back of the ute right now and our diff center is coming tomorrow. So I'm kind of stranded at the moment in two wheel drive. Um, yeah, so I need this to happen ASAP. So really grateful for these guys to help sort this out. You have no idea how much this is helping out because I've been stressing out a bit. I've got a trip coming up and I need, I need this vehicle sorted out. So diff housing and a brand new center for the Land Cruiser. Things are happening. It's going to be a very busy day here today. And a massive three days it ended up being. The more Travis and the boys from PDP dug into the vehicle, the more stuff they found needed replacing because, you know, I need, I need this vehicle to be super reliable because they head out into remote places. Towing a vehicle home in the middle of nowhere is, is not a fun thing. It's a very costly thing. So in this video, you're going to get some tips and hints on some of the things that we do. And also the next segment coming up right now is the the brief of the list of everything that we changed. I'm here with Trav. You've had a busy three days, mate. Yeah, it's coming to the end, so I'm Yeah, we're nearly there, there, aren't we? So this is a brief, and then we're going to little tips and details on every little thing. I found some cool stuff out about the diff center. So diff center and diff housing replaced. Wheel bearings, we'll touch on that as well. And the drivetrain. And, and the drivetrain, yeah, the general service overview. The whole cooling system, we'll, we'll run you through that, what we have done is with the 150,000 k service as well. With some tips of what to yep. do if you are gonna do one thing. Yep, the other and what's economical. The oils, we're sending them off for testing. Yeah, so we, we've started sampling the oils, so then we can, you know, if, if there is any wear and tear, we can try and mm. catch it early, or if there's anything going on, contaminations. And just to mention, it's been 20,000 k's since I was in here last, yeah. so that's the longest stint I've done before a serve between services. Yeah, because we know the east coast, so mm. and so it's 20, definitely K's. done some work, different terrain. So talk about the tyres, because a lot of people want to know about these tyres. And you've done a lot of different towing and driving situations, yep. obviously with the tyres. So something a bit concerning was the brakes. So I'll get to that. Ronnie's taken the box off the back, so all the power distribution module electrical stuffs out. So we're yeah, going right. to change that for the next trip. Just going to we're going to run the fridge and a few other things in the back and some interesting things we found on the bull bar there is a bolt missing two bolts there's two bolts missing yeah. was there yeah. one on each side yeah just on this side yeah all right we'll, we'll get to that so i'm sure you agree that was a fairly extensive list for 150,000 k's now to all those people who are going to comment down below and say 150,000 k's all this stuff already gone wrong what's wrong with the car there's nothing wrong with this car the amount of work, hard work this vehicle has done, I class what happens to this vehicle to be somewhere between a very frequent traveler and an ex-mining Land Cruiser. Those ones that live underground their whole life and just get wrecked. That's the kind of life this vehicle has. Harsh environments, hot, cold, really remote areas, long grass in the radiators, water crossings, mud, all the silt. Mud is the biggest killer all the hardware on all the driving gear coming up and down sand dunes all the shock loads towing you name it recoveries all that hard work is what is the actual cause of all this my vehicle is used for a hobby well basically my lifestyle and my job this vehicle is does everything that i do that is why that list is so extensive and that is why we are pulling stuff out that we could probably get away with but we want to make sure this vehicle is super reliable. I don't want to be towed home from the middle of the outback or stranded out there. So 
if you ever see this vehicle for sale, don't buy it because you, you know what it's been through. It's never gonna be for sale and that's why I can say that. So just keep that in mind. The list starts now. This is what we replaced with the cooling system. So I've got a list here just in case we miss some things. Radiator. I'll let you take this one. Um, the reason we've replaced the radiator, obviously it's done 150,000 Ks, um, debris in the front. We have serviced it once before as well. The top tank's discolouring. It's already been taken off and resealed once, which all the crimps get undone. The price point that we could get a radiator for, it's not worth servicing it again. And with Ronnie going to remote places, it's more economical to just put a brand new one in it. We know it's new, the seals are good, the core's good. And it's done 150,000 Ks. Rather We've than got relying it. on a refurbish something. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, we do live in a world that sometimes now it's a throwaway society. So we're not actually, you know, it's, it's more economical to put new stuff in. Mm. So, and peace of mind. Uh, peace of mind is the main thing for me. Yeah. And on, on the way back from the East Coast, this was the first time I ever hit triple digits yep. on, the, on the heating. Yep. I was towing, towing a trailer over the Great Divide. We pulled this tank out. And you then brought up the fact that if we pull this out, we're going to have to replace the hoses or cycle through my spare hoses yeah. and all that because yeah. it, was, it makes sense, right? Yeah, we'll work this down. Yeah, that was one thing we said. We Ronnie did have um, did have uh, new hoses in the car, so what we've done they're probably what twelve months old. So yeah, my, that, for my spare but, parts. Uh, spare parts. So what we've through. done is we're going to put new ones in the back again, um, and then bring the ones we had in the back of the car in the front of the car, so they're not ten years old when you go to use them and they're. They're all buggered mm. or dry belts that have been in the back of the car. We've put that same thing, new dry belt on the front of the car, and then we'll have another spare. We've well, actually, the dry belt, you're going to keep the other one as a spare. Yeah, I'll you? keep the other one as a spare, but, but that's a good point to bring up actually. If you have spare parts and you've kept them for five years, they, especially they dry are, belts, they, they're aging. Yeah. They're aging um, as, as probably almost as much as if they're being used. Yeah. Well, it's not Let's cut to the water pump. Slight noise out of that one. Do you think that could have been from water and just as well? Yeah, wear and tear as well. Or is it just, just a... That's probably one thing we see around your kilometres, water pumps. Well, Wayne's done his... Yeah, he did do his... Uh... Yeah, and he did the bearings as well. Mm. How many Ks are done his car? Well, his see, his was completely... Gone? Yeah, but normally loose. what happens is they leak. And then on sits there like that. Under here, there's a drain hole where they bleed out the bearings. Yeah. And you see coolant running down the front of the block. Oh wow, well, okay. So it's a bit of a telltale sign. You and you'll be able to smell the coolant obviously when it comes yeah, out. Yeah, you'll just see a bit of stain down the front. So when you get a new water pump, it doesn't come with a thermostat? Just a seal? Just the seal for the thermostat and the gasket. Okay. We were talking about the pulleys and that. So we pull two other pulleys off before yep. we get to the, to the, the tensioner. I, the assembly. idler and the tensioner, yep. Yep. So we'll just cut to that. So we stepped away from the uh, vehicle because it's pretty noisy over there. So these are the two pulleys we're taking off. Cactus, the bearings on them. This one was a wobbly one, yeah? Yeah. And this one here, you couldn't see it, but you could feel it. You could feel it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I can feel it when I spin it. The, the tip is to basically see if it wobbles first. You gotta take a belt off to do it. Belt off first, yeah. and, and then, then grab it and you yeah. feel it. Like yeah. checking your wheel bearings. Yeah, basically. It, should, it should spin freely, you know, without any sort of roughness to it, and it shouldn't have any play in it. Yeah, I can feel that. That's good. So you don't really want to wait till you can hear it because yeah, I can feel that too. Yeah, you can feel that this time, yeah. You feel it lumpy. Yeah. So usually the water pump, so either them or the water pump you're gonna get the noise from, but mm. and I have been getting a noise, uh, but when it heats up it seems to go away. Yeah. Which is pretty common. Yeah. I'll put it down to water crossings, would you agree? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's hot, it's been running for hours and then yeah. it straight in it. And then because all it's got is the seal in the front. So when they're hot it sucks in water, yeah. alright? Yeah. Coming out the bearing grease and there's like any rust marks the water's also the got there. mud in there to me like that. So, you know, yeah, you know, so like it's an air and... With the tensioner assembly, we couldn't buy the tensioner pulley on its own. Um, but so there's also bearings inside this kit too, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, big spring. And as well, this is the only thing that tensions the dry belt. So at 150,000 Ks, dry belt tension is critical. Um, all the late model cars now, obviously you don't have to tighten your belts or reset them and adjust them. This guy does it all for you automatically. It's spring loaded. Um, so obviously it does have a wear factor in it as well. You will start to lose a bit of spring tension over time. Um, so it's good to replace it. However, how that sits on the engine, the alternator had to come off and yeah, it, was a, it wasn't a five second job. It wasn't putting, easy job. Yeah, so <laughs> um, wrestled with one nut that was stuck on there. So that's in the car. Um, 
with the, the new pulleys as well and the tensioner. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, like I said, the water pump's in it, the radiator's in it, the hose is in it, and the other one, we've drained the block as well, drained the cooling system completely, and we're running the Toyota Long Life cooling in it, which is rated it? for 150,000 Ks as well. Oh, is it? So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure on that. So yeah, long, it's super long life coolant, so. Okay. Um, yeah, we've, we, as it's never been, had to be topped up. It is a pre-mix, so we just put the straight Toyota cooling in it. And um, we do see some customers that have had their radiator done and they've gone from an aftermarket coolant, and I actually believe that causes more problems than running the manufacturer's coolant. Because you're contaminating two different coolants. Yeah. So um, I would always say genuine coolant. The coolant these days is really good quality. Oh, OME. Yeah, for sure. Oops, OEM. OEM, yeah, <laughs> OME, old man <laughs> EMU. Just real quick, here is a tip how to uh, bleed out the system, the cooling system on a VDJ, because uh, mate of mine, Nathan, he got someone else to do his, and he had a bit of trouble with it afterwards, he still had air in the system, so this is a quick tip on how to do it with these vehicles. Um, look, some other vehicles will probably have the same system, right? Two. Yeah, well, air locks in a cooling system can be quite annoying, and, and they don't take five minutes to get out, and there is little um, tips or you know tricks mm. to getting it out as well. First one, obviously, everyone knows, have the heater tap open, go for a drive, you know, let it cool down. So run, um, run your heater, basically. Yeah, run your heater. Uh, one thing on a VDJ Land Cruiser, this is a bleed nipple on the top here. It is a 3.8 drive socket to undo it. Don't do it back up with it. You will snap it off in there. We often see them snapped off. There's an O-ring on it, just thumb and forefinger. And make sure the engine is cool. Yes, don't open this or any <laughs> cooling system when it's hot. It is no. a pressurized system and it will burn you. So yep. that's one bleeder there. The trick that we do here, this is another one from Toyota that's up here as well. Uh, when we bleed the cooling system, what we actually do is we pump the coolant through here so that it pushes all through the heater core, all through here, and pushes the air out of the reservoir and out of the top tank with those two off. And we actually see all the air bubbles come out. So that's our little shortcut that gets it out. Um, the only thing is obviously with aftermarket- Would you take the lid off then? Yeah, so what we do is we have the lid off of here and the cap off the top of the radiator at the top tank, and we pump the coolant in here. And then what it does is it fills all the chambers with the coolant and then pushes the air out the top. Yeah, because that's up higher than here. Correct, yeah. So that's where the air will, will get stuck. The air will always come up here. But the only thing is, obviously, if you've got aftermarket coolers or things have been changed in the engine bay and this bleed point isn't here, it is doable. It just takes a little bit longer. Mm. Um, what we're saying, guys, you know, it can take two drives, let it cool back down, top it back up, check your... Um, the bleeder on the top of the radiator again, fill that up with a high funnel, a high point. So you can put a funnel in here, a high point, fill the tank completely, pressurizes that and pushes the air back out of here. Okay. Can take a couple of goes. But what you need to watch with airlocks is sometimes you can drive the car, it might look like it's operating fine, all of a sudden gets an airlock and it just gets this big spike in temperature. So, you know, don't just do it and go for an hour drive just 100% make sure that you haven't got an airlock. The other thing, cooling systems, make sure it's well done before a trip you don't want any leaks no. in the cooling system. You no. have four hours into your drive out of town. That could so. ruin your trip. Here we have the brand new diff, which has made me very happy. So look, thanks again to Newtown Toyota. Yes, I am plugging them because they have helped me out a lot here, a lot. Very we've grateful We've got full drive back now. We've got full drive back so. now. I was stuck in two wheel drive and we're going on a trip in how long? couple of weeks? Uh, less than two weeks, isn't it? Less than two weeks. Less You're trying to get your canopy done, but you're yeah, working on my car. doing your car. It's supposed to be one day job and it's a three day yeah, job because you kept out, finding everything. Yeah, but we want to get it right. There's yeah. no point having two goes at it, so yeah. So obviously grateful for you guys as well, helping out here. Um, brand new diff housing. The other one was cracked. Yeah, so we had the hairline fracture, which we could feel from inside once we had the diff pumpkin mm. out. Um, we, could, we could feel that on the shocky landing over there. Service video, 100,000, I mentioned it. I yeah. mentioned it before yeah, that. So we, we did know that was a problem that was coming and mm. we were like, oh, well, let's deal with it a bit later. There was a few other things we wanted to get out of the way first. Um, and money was an issue. Yeah. As well. Um, and we knew the locker, there was, it was gonna blow out. Every time you, mm. if you're gonna pull down a front diff as well, you going to make the most of it. Yeah. So there's a few things we wanna show you there as well with the bearings. Inside here, brand new. Yeah, so we've gone with a complete new carrier so it's the carrier the crown wheel the locking mechanism the locker motor um, we priced up the crown wheel and pinion and to pull it apart and service and put it all back together um, let alone not even counting labor just the pricing it was much more economical once again 
just to replace the whole diff center. It's all set up, let and, alone and labor. Peace, peace of mind as well. And peace of mind, everything's yeah. new. The way I look at it is I've got 150,000 kilometers out of the previous one. I should get the same out of this one unless I change my driving style and just drive completely stupid. I, people want to know how I broke. Leading up to this event of the braking, uh, one, I drove, accidentally drove 30 k's in full drive on the highway. I'm not sure if that's got anything to do with it. It was a straight line. I didn't do any turns, so I don't think they had much to do with it. Um, we had a noise, which we thought it was, was a CV. Sort of, yeah, it was. We that changed one, that. Yeah, it was only when it was locked in. Yep, and I still probably, had it afterwards. I reckon that was the uptake of just the tooth being bruised. Yeah, the bru bruised tooth. And it was tooth. just now and then on, on, on the cycling when it hit that point. It was only when it was all loaded. Yeah, loaded, yeah. So that's and why there was a bruised yeah. tooth, and then obviously it's had its last hurrah and let go. Yeah, so, and that took a while, a year and a half we had that. Yeah. I think, because we, we, were, we were trying to find it, couldn't find it. And then I loaded it up by, oh look, I was, I was trying to beat someone else's time on this training course we got. So this is my own fault. I drove down a hill, I let it coast down a hill, smashed it into first gear low. So all that pressure and all the, all the force and weight on the front, that's when it went bang. And then I was stuck in a hole in two wheel drive, but I managed to get out. That's what happened. And we replaced it. I mean, at least it was the front. You can disengage the full drive, still get home. If it's yeah. a rear diff, it's a bit of a... Well, I've driven home yeah, 500 k's yeah, in, fr in front wheel drive before. Front end, yeah. <laughs> so. so here is Simon explaining how it can happen in here, how the uh, pinion, how the crown wheel skipped a tooth. So we'll cut to that now. Well, I've got Simon here from PDP. He's working on the cruiser at the moment. So you explained it to me pretty well how it can skip across the teeth because there's not much movement as you can see. Basically when the front wheels are under load as you would be in full drive and they've got good traction and things, the two half shafts come in here and sort of hold that in place. You've got the pinion shaft that's coming in from the back and it's spinning at sort of 90 degrees to this. As it's all loading up, the way the pinion shaft spins, it's actually pushing a sideways force against the coronal wheel here. And what it eventually does is it actually pushes this away even though it looks nice and big and strong, because it's quite tall, it doesn't have much uh, leverage to hold in place, so it actually pushes, and in your case, it's actually bent this housing away. So you can see it's bent it so much that there's actually play, lateral play in the housing. And a lot of moving in that. What that's done is allowed it to actually jump a tooth. It's pushed it away under the load and allowed it to jump a tooth. And once it jumps a tooth, then as it lands on the next tooth with all the load, because mm -hmm. it lands sort of halfway up the tooth, it's not all the way in because it's been pushed away. It takes the top off the tooth and then the yep. tooth gets minced up with all the other teeth and it's just yeah it's and there's over. just collateral damage throughout the whole yeah. thing when this initially happened we were talking about maybe it's just a crown wheel or opinion but you're better off just replacing the whole lot in this case we had to anyway because it's yeah the housing flexing. Is, housing's bent so you can't really Mm. You could, I mean, you can adjust this and, and put it in, but the problem is that because it's twisted the housing, the bearings aren't going to sit, they won't run parallel, you're going to have a whole sort of knock on effect of other problems afterwards. Problem again, anyway. Yeah, mm. so it just won't be reliable. So, just all that force that's multiplied four times here, because it's a four to one, yeah? yeah. That's what's got the, the amount of force to just to push it out, that's yeah, what's happening. Basically, you imagine you've got a, a 35 inch tire that's sort of stuck either in the sand or whatever, and you've got your big V8 motor. Mm. In first low, you know, low ratio, the reduction four to one, all that force coming through the shaft, lifting on that, it literally just climbs on top of the, the crown wheel until it, it forces that away and then it just yeah, it spits the teeth out basically. It's like having the world's longest screwdriver levering on yeah. something. Yeah. Better luck next time. <laughs> <laughs> Better luck with this one. <laughs> this paint here is what they use in the factory so to set up the crown wheel and pinion. Um, basically, you're checking two things with it. The first thing that you check is that when you put the pinion shaft in, it's got two taper roller bearings and you're checking that the shimming of the pinion is correct. So that the pinion is sitting in the correct position onto the crown wheel where it meshes. You see how the paint has sort of been cleared away in the middle of the tooth? That's ideally where you roughly want it. It's the strongest part of the tooth. If you've got too many shims in the pinion here, it will normally push it all the way up into the middle here and that will make it too tight because as you can see, the teeth are sort of tapered and the taper will get in and it'll be too tight and it'll bind. If you have not enough shims in there, it'll pull the pinion away and then it will be rubbing on there. And as you can imagine, the lever effect on the outside edge of the tooth there is not the strongest part that you want to be. So this is 
the best area that you want the, the pinion to be sitting, running against the crown wheel. Um, the other thing that you do is you then also, with the two lateral adjustments here, you adjust how the crown wheel comes into the pinion. So you're also adjusting the depth this way with these two adjustments here. With these two adjustments, you're also adjusting the backlash so that there needs to be a, a set amount of play in there so that it's not too tight and it doesn't bind up and obviously overheat and damage everything. So that's basically three adjustments you're doing. And this engineer's paint just shows you that it's all running roughly in the right place. A lot of Land Cruiser owners will probably relate to this. When you load it up and you're trying to go up a hill and you don't make it and then you put your foot on a clutch, you hear that backlash. Yeah. It's a combination. It's, it's from your the drive, shaft the drive member at the wheel at the hub there, your freewheeling hub. There's a bit of play in the teeth there. The half shaft that comes into the splines here, there's a bit of play there. The splines in the propeller shaft, there's the gears in the transfer box. Where each one each one obviously has to have a small amount of play, because if it was had no play, it would just bind up the and it would be too tight. So mm. all the way along the gearbox, the transfer box, the prop shafts, the half shafts, everything's got a bit of play. And when you let go, it's all been literally sp sprung loaded. And when you let go, it's just all that energy is released and it gives you that sort of backlash chatter. So basically, like shock absorbing. Yeah. Shock load absorbing. Yeah. Interesting. I've been asked before which types of oils I use, so here we go, oils and grease. With the diff oils, I'm using LSD oils 90 front and rear. Now, quick tip about LSD oil, you can use it for non-LSD and LSD differentials, but you can't do it the other way around. As far as engine oil, for the past year I've gone back to the factory Toyota engine oil, which is recommended for this vehicle. This is the bearing grease that we use, SKF bearing grease. This is the best stuff we've found so far, and we've kept it a bit of a secret for a while, but here it is, cat's out of the bag. This is by far the best grease we've found to keep water contamination to a minimum. I'm not gonna talk about a tire yet, very soon. What is that, what's the correct term for that? Oh, it could be called many things. Um, front bearing hub or bearing spindle, um, what we've done with Ronnie's car this time, we've replaced this. The main reason why we replaced it is the sealing surface around here where the back grease hub seal that seals the back of the bearing hub. So that would normally slide onto here, but it would actually sit like this. And then the you outer bearing is here. Um, what's happening is, is there's grooving in here and like I said, rust behind it. The seal isn't sealing as good as we'd like, so we've replaced it. Um, Obviously, the other side's already been replaced when we replaced your CV joint. Mm. That was some time ago. But you've actually replaced the whole, this whole yeah, part. Yeah, so we, we replaced the whole part. There is a needle roller inside here and a bronze bush as well that supports the CV drive shaft that comes out here. Then it goes to the locking hub, which is this fella here. What we want to try and minimise is any contamination to the bearing, because mm. then the bearing life, we're going to get a lot that more life out of it. barely contaminated on this side. Um, well, we had water ingress. In, mm. There was a bit of rust and what have you in there. So which, that was the worst one, right? It was the worst one. Um, which you can see pitting on the hub as well, on the case hardening. So obviously if we're going to put something in, we're going to make sure new seals. That was the other thing, we were always using the genuine seals. We find they work best. If you're going remote travel, just don't, don't go cheap on parts. Yeah, because it's going to cost you more in the long run, all the yeah. repairs, or in, and when you are remote, well, like you mentioned, you a lot of money how much there. to get home. Yeah, how much so, to tell your car home for the middle of the outback. Yeah. So that's shocking. why actually, and touching on that, look, the bearings in Ronnie's car, we probably could have cleaned them and got away with it. We just, it's not worth taking that gamble. The weight, what he does, contamination, yeah, which put new ones. Them, yeah. yeah, which is sort of, yeah, yeah it's, we just went down that line. We, we, the same thing again, we use the genuine, the Koyo bearings. Mm. Um, once again, we haven't gone for a cheaper branded bearing, so to say. Keep in mind, I, I do, the vehicle does get punished compared so, to. Yeah. And obviously bigger wheels, yeah. towing, it's increased load on the bearings. That's mm. the other thing. Underbelly of the cruiser. What I wanted to show you here is something that, well, neither of us has seen this before, especially on my vehicle. The amount of um, paint that's been stripped off. Yeah, it's been like sandblasted. Yeah, I mean, look at, look at the rear diff. There's no paint left at all, except the for these springs. little corners. And yeah. Everything. I've, the, the tail shaft, that's a genuine tail shaft too. There's just no paint left on it at all. Definitely, mm. uh, probably say more, what, you reckon across the Simpsons? You reckon that was Well, maybe every track? sand unit going over, this, this yeah, shaft is moving. spinning as I'm going over. Yeah. It, You've I mean, still got half the Simpson under you. It is a long wheelbase. And then I also went through seawater uh, about a week before across the Simpson. The car hadn't had a wash, yeah. so it's, it's probably, yeah, yeah, and all, vehicles get yeah. punished. It's, it's been well used. Um, but yeah, and then there's long trips as well. 
to try and wash in between there is pretty you, hard. You can't really. So. Well, you can give it a quick wash, but you're not going to get a thorough wash. But so yeah, any, anything, anything we did under here? Um, really? No, just the rear wheel bearings we've done. Uh, full brake fluid flush all around and the clutch fluid Let's flush. Let's talk about the oil. The oil in here was the blackest we've ever seen, but it has also been in there for yep. a lot longer. Yeah, it's on 20,000. And I was towing. Yep. Towing yeah, hard. Yeah, so actually, no, it wasn't too bad. I've sampled it. Yeah. So we've got the front diff, the rear diff, and we've got the engine oil samples to send away to the lab, get them back and see what they come back with. Oh, yeah. Actually, well, it wasn't, it wasn't too bad, the rear diff. Yeah. Let's get the samples. Yeah. Grab Oh, where did Trav go? There he is. All samples. So we, we, we missed one of them though, didn't we? That's the front diff. Front diff, rear diff, yeah, engine. So you look at the, you can see here. Engine this all is pretty black as all. Well. Yeah, this one's a lot cleaner than the front. The front one was the dirty one. The front one was the dirty yeah, one. Yeah, you can definitely tell. Who's that? Sorry. <laughs> Now, brief chat about the brakes that I tested out. I put terrain tamer brakes front and rear, rotors, brake pads, everything. Um, did the car stop better? Yes, it did. However, after 20,000 k's, the rear brake pads were gone. Very thin there. So it's uneven wear. Yeah, it's a little bit uneven there, but then when you turn them here, it's not a huge. Okay, caliper slides, what have you else, what have you. But at the end of the day as well, they are drilled and slotted rotors, mm. so obviously they say they you know, help cleaning, what have you, but there's going to be more wear margin but on so the But so is the front thing. though, the front's Yeah, right. correct, yeah. So there's but more pad area and also you've been towing. Mm. But also the surface of the rotor is actually recessed a bit, there's a yeah. little lip on the end now. Yeah. On I'd the expect them to last longer, but you have been more towing, so we put the genuine ones in there now, you're still going to do towing. Well until then we don't we're, we're we're not going to know the real difference. Yeah. Onto the tyres, the Max's razors, so far so good. I'm going to have to swap the fronts to the backs. I'll put them back on where they are again. I just want to swap them around just to get a bit more life out of them. I'm specifically not taking my spares and rotating them in. I don't want to do that. I want to show you guys how many Ks you will get out of a set that you don't rotate because let's face it, most people don't actually rotate their tyres even though they should. Most actually don't. So therefore, I'm not rotating mine. Um, so far, I'm pretty happy with them. Very grippy. I've only scalloped one tyre a little bit, two chunks have come out. I think that's from a recovery that I can remember. But other than that, they're still pretty quiet. They are noisier than when I got them, obviously, but they are still very quiet. The quietest tyre that I've ever had on a four-wheel drive so far. A proper review to come, about another 20,000 Ks, then I'll do a review on these, because then I would have done 40,000 kilometres. Here is the bracket, my exhaust bracket, which snapped off during the trip. What did happen, in all fairness to this bracket, ARB put another fuel tank in the back, which I purchased just before I left on the, on the big trip. And they had to move the exhaust on one side. So the exhaust guy moved it, but when he moved it, there was a bit too much tension on the bracket, and that's why I think it snapped. So all the corrugations and the tension on the bracket has just snapped. So what I've done is I've got a new bracket. It took me four weeks to get that bracket, by the way. I got the new bracket and I drilled some holes, so extra holes in it to move the stress point a bit and to make it a bit more relaxed and um, we'll see how that goes. So here's the snap bolts in the uh, bull bar. I have no idea when they happened. Uh, done a bit of winching and done a few snatch strap recoveries. No, because they come off the chassis. So it's got to do with the winch, I reckon, pulling, or I've hit something with the bull bar that I can't remember. You see the top bolt? Right there. And then the same bolt on the other side, on the inside. Yep, which I can't see with the camera, so. Yep. But yeah, that's a bit concerning. It's pretty common practice. Guys won't use Deutsch plugs when they install bull bars and solder with heat shrink. You will pay extra for that, but that's what I'd recommend you ask for. Lights and everything will work when you drive away, but if you have a look in here, what you'll see is that open-ended connectors, they just get full of dirt, mud, yeah. corrosion, water. I've had that problem in previous vehicles too. And then it just, it's all over. The Deutsch plug here, which is newer, that's going to our side light we've got there, but then this one here, you can see the wire there is corroded out completely. Um, that's your open-ended connector. So 
you'll probably find that is just yeah you can see all the ends are full of dirt and moisture and long term your lights stop working your tire is rotating this way so when you're going through mud and water it's flicking that way but it's also flicking up into here and that's where all the mud and stuff gets caught so you probably notice when you wash your full drive every now and then your front of your bull bar wings are completely saturated in mud and um, that's what happens so they get stuck in all the connectors and anything that's in there it gets stuck into and that's why some people's winches they stop uh, working after a while because they don't flush out everything out and all that silt and mud and crap it just it kills it, it kills everything as you can see the box is no longer here but you probably already knew that and look how high the vehicle is now now i'm parked on an angle just kidding the fridge is back in though and i had the pdm units in the back here the power distribution module i had the keypad in the back here so everything still run from the front but the boys at PDP just rerouted the power, so now I'm running off the second battery in the front until I get this new thing sorted on the back here. So I can now run my fridge again, straight through the same wires I was using before. It's all these color coder wires. So I can even run another fridge here if I want. Uh, all the lights have been rerouted to the front batteries now as well, so I can use the vehicle in its entirety again. And uh, when I get the box on, I'll just change it all. So just to let you know what's going on with that. Thanks for watching all the way to the end. So that was pretty much everything that happened to the vehicle. Uh, more to come on the box in the back when, well, it's not a box. I want to give too much away there. So stop asking questions. Lastly, I want to thank the guys at PDP for taking the three days aside and then sorting this car out because I've got a few trips coming up. One was actually with Travis from PDP, so maybe that's why he got into it. Nah, nah, they, he always looks after me. The vehicle is complete now. I've just finished a little test drive around out here in Mundaring. And also a massive thank you to Newtown Toyota for helping me out with the diff housing and the diff center. That really, really helped out. So I can now get the vehicle, well, I now have the vehicle back in full drive, out on the tracks, doing what I need to do. So cheers guys. Cheers everyone. Cheers for watching. Subscribe somewhere here. Uh, support creation at patreon.com slash Ronnie Dahl. And there's another video down here of my 100,000k service. Cheers. See ya.